Where I live, we're really fortunate to have pretty much year-round access to great produce. I like to treat vegetables with the care and attention they deserve to thank the hardworking farmers who feed us. Today, I'm gonna to show you three fantastic vegetable recipes. love potato salads. I know they can be a little contentious. For example, I remember serving one to my dad where the potatoes were unpeeled, like these ones, and he just wasn't having it. Some people like their potatoes mushy, I like them a little more firm, but there's lots of different ways to make potato salad. This one is one of my favorites. So we're gonna start by cooking asparagus that's gonna be chopped up and added to the salad. And this is my favorite way to cook asparagus. I've got it in a single layer in a heat-proof dish, and I'm just gonna add enough boiling water to cover it. What this does is it basically poaches the spears, takes about five minutes, a little bit longer if they're really thick, and you just wanna cover it and let them do their thing. And when they've softened, I will test them to make sure with the tip of a sharp knife, we'll put them in an ice water bath. So while those are cooking away, I'm going to just give you a few clues about the potatoes. I like to use the little baby potatoes. I really like the flavor uh, and the color of them. And it's nice because they really don't require peeling. They cook quickly on top of that. So I've quartered about a pound and a half of little potatoes. And then when I drained them while they were still hot, I added about a half a shallot chopped up and the heat of the potatoes cooked the onion. Now for some people who ask, well there's lots of people who ask this question often, shallot, scallion, what's the difference? So scallion is a term that's used most often I find in the US for what we tend to call in Canada green onions, you know those long uh, slender ones. This is a shallot, so it's a little red onion with quite a mild flavor. A lot of restaurants will use extremely finely minced shallot to finish a dish right before serving. So it's pleasant to eat, not cooked, and adds a really nice bright flavor note. So there you go, shallot versus scallion. So I am also going to make a really nice vinaigrette to go with this and I'm going to show you how I do it with an immersion blender. You could absolutely whisk and whisk and whisk away for three or four or five minutes, but I find this is just a little bit easier. So it's a very simple vinaigrette. I've got some salt and pepper in my beaker here already. I'm adding in some rice vinegar. It's about a tablespoon and a half, I think. Maple syrup, just because I love that flavor instead of putting in just ordinary granulated sugar. Honey is also a great option, and if your honey is a bit thick, just give it a quick trip through the microwave so it's more liquefied. And Dijon mustard is another favorite of mine in vinaigrettes, partly because it helps the dressing emulsify, which means it's going to uh, bind together and stay together. So the reason that I recommend doing it with an immersion blender is that it helps with that binding process. You have to add the oil, I'm using canola oil today, really, really slowly, like almost a couple of drops at a time. So this is a process of patience, but I tell you, it is worth it. The dressing that you make will stay emulsified for days in the refrigerator. So I often will make a big batch of a couple different kinds of vinaigrette and use them throughout the week, including Caesar dressings, all kinds of things. And it's all based on the same technique. So pardon the noise, here we go. I'm gonna just buzz these things together first. There we go, and now I'm gonna drizzle the oil in. A measuring cup or a little jug with a good spout is the perfect way to do it because you can just rest it on the edge and off you go. We're about halfway there, and I just wanted you to see our dressing is really uh, coming together beautifully. It's got a nice thickness to it. And now we'll just finish and add the rest of the oil. All right, we finished adding the oil, and as you can see, the vinaigrette has a really nice creamy appearance, and that's a lot different than if I just shook the ingredients together in a jar, which you may have seen me do for different recipes. So if you can make the time to do it this way, it's really, really worthwhile. And this can be refrigerated for days if you're not going to use it immediately. All right, our asparagus should be cooked now. I'm just going to transfer it to this ice water bath. This of course just suspends the cooking and you want to do that so it doesn't get um, 
too soggy or too mushy and start to lose its vibrant green color. Overcooked asparagus can kind of take on this kind of gray hue that isn't very appealing. So we'll just give it a few turns in here. And I should note as well, before I cook the asparagus, I did snap the woody ends off. Those are not very edible and uh, they don't uh, cook very well in any method, including this one. All right, the asparagus seems to be cooled off. So I'm just going to place it on this kitchen towel to dry it before I add it to the potatoes. And you want to cut the asparagus into bite-sized pieces that will comfortably fit on a fork. Longer pieces might look a little more interesting or attractive, but they're not very convenient to eat. So I'll just line up all the beautiful tips and cut those off. And then we'll cut these in probably inch or 2.5 centimeter size pieces. So I'm going to add those to the potatoes. Already you can see what great color the salad is going to have. And for more color and flavor and texture, a couple of radishes are a really nice option. If you don't prefer radishes, some people find them a little too peppery, you can use red pepper instead. And just slice them fairly thinly. There's lots of different kinds of radishes out there. And if you experiment a little, you may find ones that appeal to you more than some others. And springtime in Canada anyway is the very best time for radishes. They tend to be at their most um, flavorful yet mild at that time of year. Give that a little toss. Oops. Okay, and the other important element of this salad is a lot of fresh herbs. One thing to note with herbs is they're a great way to boost flavor without having to rely on a lot of salt, for example. So I tend to favor thing, vinegary, acidy things like fresh lime and lemon juice, rice vinegar and so on, as well as herbs and rely on those as my flavor enhancers. So I'm going to cut the herbs and then we'll dress the salad and add the herbs on top so they don't uh, get washed away by the dressing. And I use a fair bit for this salad, mostly just because I really like them. I'm using dill and parsley today. Uh, you could use fresh thyme, you could use basil if you like. It's a great way to use up whatever herbs you might have on hand. we go. So now we're going to drizzle our dressing over. Look how thick that is. It's just fantastic. And as I always like to counsel, I don't put in all the dressing. I want to give it a toss first and then take a look at the bottom of the bowl. And it's nice to see a little coating there, but not a puddle. That means you've overdressed your salad and it looks just perfect on the bottom here. All right, so now with our herbs. And I also don't like to overdress with garnishes. So quite often I'll put a good sprinkling of the herbs on and then put the rest in a dish to be passed at the table so folks can add more if they like a lot of herbs as I do. All right, our potato salad with asparagus and radishes is ready to hit the table. If you're a big fan of corn on the cob, as I am, you're going to want to stay tuned for my next recipe. It's a tasty new way to enjoy a favorite vegetable, and it's a great dish to make ahead and reheat.
When you have an abundance of fresh herbs from your garden or some in the fridge that you've purchased and want to use up before they spoil, why not make some herb butter? Simply blend together softened butter with your chopped herb of choice, add in something really flavorful like some balsamic or citrus juice, roll it up in a log, put it in the fridge or freezer and you can slice off a disc to flavor lots of different dishes anytime you like. I love corn on the cob. To me, there's nothing better throughout late July, August into September, at least in Canada, my part of Canada, but there's lots more ways to enjoy it than just kind of channeling your inner squirrel. So today I'm going to show you a method that I was taught by a southern chef and it's very, very popular in the southern US. It's a cream style corn, but it's not like what you expect from a can. Much, much better. So we're going to start by getting our pan heated up and apologies for the noise. And to that, we're going to add a little bit of bacon fat. Now, when I was taught this recipe, um, I think that there was probably about, I don't know, half a cup of bacon fat in that pan. I just can't do that. So I've got just under a tablespoon. And then to uh, up the fat quotient, we're going to use butter. You could use canola oil instead if you prefer. So we'll just get that melted. Oops, better put it all in the pan. And while that melts, we're going to finish getting our corn ready. So I have uh, taken the kernels off three cobs already, and I've got one left. These are raw. And you can absolutely do this step with a sharp knife. You just have to hold it carefully, and down you go. There's one drawback I find with that, and that's if you cut too deeply, you get sort of the bristly parts that hold each um, kernel of corn to the cob, and I don't like that texture. So my preferred method is to use what they call a corn stripper or a corn zipper. How cute is this? The little happy face on on it just cracks me up every time I pull it out of the drawer. It's got a little serrated teeth on this side. There's lots of different versions out there. If you enjoy cooking with corn as opposed to just eating it off the cob, highly recommend this purchase. So you can see how it just literally unzips the corn. And this tool works equally well if you have cooked corn. Obviously, you've got to let it cool a little bit. Uh, if you have, say, kids with braces or older folks with dentures or something, and they would prefer to eat it with a fork, this is the method for them. All right, our fats have melted. So we're going to actually start with onion first. I almost forgot. So we're just going to chop up the equivalent of a small onion. Just going to turn that down a little. And you could use whatever onion you prefer. Red onion would be equally good in this. And I've minced it fairly small. So into the pot with that. And we'll give it a stir. And that needs to cook for about a minute and a half or so until it has softened. So while that's doing its thing, I'm going to slice up some red pepper. I've made this with sweet red pepper, which is what this is, and also a hotter red pepper, like a seeded red jalapeno, and that's really, really yummy if you want a little heat in yours. Or you could use a combo of the two of them. And again, we want to do a fine dice like we did with the onions. This would be about the equivalent of one small red pepper. Okay, my onions are looking great, so I'm going to add in the pepper. And I've mentioned this before. Notice that I'm wiping it off my board, not with the sharp part of the blade, but the back side, so I don't dull my blade. And now we're going to add in our corn. And we'll give it a stir. 
you want to try and make sure all the vegetables are coated with the butter and bacon fat mixture because that helps them to cook and also helps them caramelize their sugars. We're going to turn up the heat a little. And I don't know if you noticed in the bowl, there were some long segments of corn that came off the cob, but the minute you start stirring them, they just gently fall apart and that's just perfect. So don't worry about breaking them up if you're using a corn stripper. All right, a little salt and pepper. Now this would be your time to add in any extra seasoning that you want. Uh, chili pepper would be a great option if you want to go with a little bit more of a southwestern or Tex-Mex kind of flair. I'm just going to leave it as is because I'm imagining this as a side dish with something that's got a lot of flavor like smoked or barbecued ribs. So this would be a perfect counterpoint and you don't want it to fight with the ribs in terms of flavor. As mentioned before, I'm a big fan of garnishes, so we're going to chop up some parsley for the top. Cilantro would be another super option for this dish. And I'm going to chop it fairly finely. Give this another stir. So once the corn has started to soften, then you want to add in the cream component. And I've seen lots of variations. I've seen some chefs that put in um, evaporated milk, which is an interesting choice. I've even seen condensed milk, which would add a lot of sweetness to it. Uh, I've seen cream. I've seen cream, seen cream cheese. I'm just adding in 10% uh, cream because I want the vegetables to really be what we taste, not the liquid. So now all we have to let that do is to have the cream bubble down a bit. And while that does its thing, I'm going to slice up a lime for a garnish. I find it's a perfect counterpoint to the sweetness of the corn and that little pop of acid uh, that hits your mouth as you spoon in the corn is just so, so perfect. All right, one more quick stir here. And I'm looking for the cream to be mostly evaporated. So the total cooking time for this dish is about 10 minutes. It can definitely be made ahead of time and uh, refrigerated. I haven't tried freezing it, so if you try it, please let me know. And then reheated either in the same pan or uh, you could even heat it in the microwave. I love to bring the pan out to the grill if we're doing a, a full-on backyard meal and reheat it on the grill and then just serve it up outdoors. So now that it's looking ready, I'm going to take it off the burner add our parsley and the color on this dish is just so fantastic I can't wait to dig into the southern style creamy corn I'm a little late to the Brussels sprouts party as I didn't particularly care for the way that they were prepared when I was growing up. But with recipes like the next one I'm about to show you, it's no wonder they've become a favorite vegetable now.
now that I know how to cook them properly, I really do enjoy finding different ways to prepare Brussels sprouts. The secret for me is making sure they get a little bit charred. Those crispy edges just add so much flavor. So I've got about a pound of fresh Brussels sprouts here. I've never worked with the frozen ones, so I really can't speak to whether or not they would work in this recipe. I have trimmed the stem ends off, and you just do that with a sharp knife. And then I went through each one, and if there were any discolored leaves on the outside, I peeled those off and discarded them. You should try and look for sprouts that are of a fairly uniform size so that they'll cook evenly. And a general rule of thumb is that the smaller they are, the more tender and flavorful they are. So they, they cook more quickly and they just have a better flavor. So now that I have cleaned these guys up, I'm gonna chop them in half and get them ready to go in the air fryer. And if you haven't used an air fryer yet, I encourage you to perhaps borrow one from a friend who has one and give it a try. I think I use mine most often for vegetables. It's just such an easy way. It's comparable to oven roasting, but it takes a lot less time. And for whatever reason, things just seem to taste better. And maybe it's because all I have to do is put this basket in the dishwasher when I'm done. So there's no uh, tray to clean up or anything. They do sell little gadgets to trim the stem ends off Brussels sprouts. They kind of core it out. I don't recommend those if you see them in a shop and think, oh, I love Brussels sprouts, I should grab that. I didn't find the several ones that I tried to be very effective. And it's really a quick job to do it by hand. You can obviously prep the sprouts ahead of time before you cook them and then just refrigerate. I wouldn't recommend cooking them ahead of time because I find they don't reheat very well. So this quantity would be enough for, I would say, four small servings as a side dish. We tend to eat uh, air fryer roasted vegetables as a main course a lot of times for lunch. So this would be probably two lunch-ish servings, I would say. All right, so now I'm going to put these back into the bowl that they were in so that I can drizzle them with a little bit of olive oil. And you can air fry without oil, but I find that things just need that little pick-me-up to have a bit of a better flavor, and it helps them get crispier. But the trick is not too much oil. I'm gonna pour in no more than a tablespoon here. Too much oil and things actually get soggy. Give that a little stir. Now, depending upon your air fryer, you may need to preheat it. This one doesn't really need it. So I'm just gonna turn it on and put these in the basket and they'll take about I would say 12 minutes or so to cook which is pretty darn quick. I'll be testing them at the 10 minute mark to see how they're doing and then when they are fully cooked I'm going to prepare a delicious compound which means a compound butter which means it's butter with some delicious add-ins to give it extra flavor. So on with the air fryer. And into the basket these go. All right, I'll see you guys in 10 minutes. All right, let's check our air fryer and see how our sprouts are doing. Oh my gosh, they are perfect. And they cooked up really, really quickly. So it's beautiful. The charred outside is delicious and then they'll be nice and tender inside. I'll just give them a poke. Oh yeah, they're perfect. So we'll keep them warm in here for now in our little mini convection oven, because that's what an air fryer is. And now we're gonna make our compound butter, which again, just means you're adding things in. So I'm gonna do a chive balsamic butter, because I find that that's a really good match for the sprouts. So we'll just mince up our chives. Probably about, I would say a tablespoon of them is what I'm looking for. And the butter I have softened. If you're in a rush, uh, you can, you can make the butter ahead of time and do it really, really quickly if you melt it first, but I don't want to cook the chives, so that's why I haven't melted it today. I've just softened it. And the only reason for softening it is to make it easier to stir. Okay, and I would say about, I'm gonna start with a teaspoon of the balsamic. You don't want the butter um, to be runny. And I've said it before, buy the good stuff. Balsamic is such a wonderful component in so many recipes and there really is a difference in flavor. All right, give this a little stir. And like I said in the helpful hint in this episode, you can make big batches of flavored butters and freeze them. 
and it's so great to be able to just pull a little bit out. If you don't want to shape it into a, a roll and slice it, you can pack it in a Ziploc bag, flatten it out, and then you just open the bag, crack off a corner, and seal it back up again. Okay, so that's how easy it is to make this so-called fancy butter. We'll get our sprouts into our serving bowl. And they really do hold together well when you prepare them by hand with care. So now we're going to dollop a little bit of this butter on here. You don't want to overwhelm them, but there needs to be enough that each sprout gets a little bit of a kiss of the flavor. Okay, I'm going to give that a stir. The sprouts are nice and hot, so the butter is melting very quickly. And we haven't yet added our salt and pepper because I want it to be sitting on top. My big thing is about layering the flavors so that they're not as muddled. Sometimes that's pleasurable, like in a pasta sauce or whatever. But for vegetable dishes, I really want to be able to discern all the different flavor components. Okay, I'm happy with that. A little bit of salt. A little bit of pepper. I'm going to be very pleased to serve up these sprouts at our next meal. If you're looking for easy and flavorful new ideas for vegetables, I hope today's show provides you with some fresh inspiration. I encourage you to try these beautiful crispy Brussels sprouts with chive balsamic butter or perhaps this southern style creamy corn. And don't forget about this potato salad with asparagus and radishes. It's a winner. Love your vegetables and eat them often.